Hello, I'm Sheldon Axler, the author of Linear Algebra Done Right. This video discusses part one of the section of the book titled Operators on Real Inner Product Spaces. In this video, we will focus on normal operators on real inner product spaces. Here are the standard assumptions we use about notation in this section. F denotes either the scalar field R of real numbers or the scalar field C of complex numbers. V will denote a finite dimensional non-zero inner product space over F. The spectral theorem gives a complete description of normal operators on finite dimensional complex inner product spaces and of self-adjoint operators on finite dimensional real inner product spaces. But we do not yet have a description of normal operators on real inner product spaces. That's what we aim to do in this video. As a tool to do that, we will need this result about two-dimensional spaces to start with. Here's what the result says. Suppose V is a two-dimensional real inner product space, and T is an operator on V. Then the following are equivalent. A, T is normal but not self-adjoint. B, the matrix of T with respect to every orthonormal basis of V has the form shown here, with A's along the diagonal, B and negative B in the off-diagonal entries, where B is not zero. And C is the same with that. Instead of saying for every orthonormal basis, it's with respect to some orthonormal basis. And here we'll insist for part C that B be a positive number. Note that the condition in part B, that the constant B be non-zero, is crucial. If B were zero, then we would clearly have a self-adjoint operator, but we are describing operators that are normal but not self-adjoint. For the proof of this result, please see the book. Now we come to another key tool. This result is new for us even in the case when V is a complex vector space, and thus we'll make no assumption here about whether V is a real or complex inner product space. Here's the result. Suppose T is an operator on our inner product space V, and T is normal. Suppose U is a subspace of V that is invariant under T. Then we have four conclusions. The first one is that the orthogonal complement of U is invariant under T. Our second conclusion is that U is invariant under the adjoint of T. Our third conclusion is that the adjoint of T restricted to U is equal to the adjoint of T restricted to U. Our fourth conclusion is that T restricted to U is a normal operator on U, and T restricted to the orthogonal complement of U is a normal operator on the orthogonal complement of U. Notice that for this last conclusion, we need part A for it to even make sense because we need to know that T restricted to the orthogonal complement of U is a linear map that sends the orthogonal complement of U into itself so that we have an operator on the orthogonal complement of U. Part A gives us exactly that. Let's look at the proof of part A of this result. We start out by letting E1 up to EM be an orthonormal basis of the invariant subspace U extend to an orthonormal basis of the whole space V by adding some additional vectors F1 up through Fn. Let's look at the matrix of T with respect to this basis of V. This matrix has the form shown here, where A, B, and C are themselves matrices of the appropriate size. The key point here is the zero in the lower left corner, which represents an n by m matrix consisting of all zeros. The reason that matrix contains only zeros is that u is an invariant subspace of t. Specifically, for each j, we can look at t of ej. t of ej will be an element of u by the invariance of u, and thus t of ej is a linear combination of the vectors e1 up through em. That means that in the matrix, we have zeros in the jth column below the mth row. 
This explains the zero shown on the slide. Recall that because t is normal, the norm of t of v is equal to the norm of t star of v for every vector v. Thus we have the equation now shown here. Now let's look at the left side of this equation. The norm of t e j squared is equal to the sum of the squares of all the entries in the jth column of the matrix. Thus the sum from j equal to 1 to m of the norm of t e j squared is equal to the sum of the squares of all the entries in the matrix A. Keep that in mind, and now let's look at the right side of the equation. The norm of t star of ej squared is equal to the sum of the squares of all the entries in the jth row of A and B. And thus the sum from j equal to 1 to m of the norm of t star ej squared is equal to the sum of the squares of all the entries in A and in B. Thus on the left side of this equation we have the sum of the squares of all the entries in A, and on the right side we have the sum of the squares of all the entries in A and in B. This implies that B is the matrix of all zeros. So B, which is now in red in the upper right corner, we will now replace with zero. The form of the matrix now implies that each of the f's gets mapped by t into some linear combination of the f's. That's precisely what it means for the orthogonal complement of u to be invariant under t. In other words, we have proved part a. That was the hard part of this proof. Please read the proofs of parts b, c, and d in the book. Now the results discussed previously in this video can be used to prove the following complete description of normal operators on real inner product spaces. Here's the result. Suppose V is a real inner product space and T is an operator on V. Then the following are equivalent. A, T is normal. Part B, there's an orthonormal basis of V with respect to which T has a block diagonal matrix such that each block is either a 1 by 1 matrix or a 2 by 2 matrix of the form shown here. You should compare this to the statement of the complex spectral theorem, which states that if T is normal, there's an orthonormal basis with respect to which T has a diagonal matrix. You can think of a diagonal matrix as a block diagonal matrix, where each block is a 1 by 1 matrix. Thus, in the real case, part B says we don't quite have that. We don't quite have one by one matrices along the diagonal, but we have either one by one matrices or something just slightly bigger, two by two matrices. Please read the proof of this result in the book. The key step is induction on the dimension of V using the previous result that if U is invariant under T, then the orthogonal complement of U is also invariant under T. The proof also uses our previous description of normal operators on a two-dimensional real inner product space. Again, please read the proof in the book. This concludes part one of the video on operators on real inner product spaces. If you see a small picture of a slide in the upper left-hand corner of this slide, then you can click on it to get to the next video. If you see a small picture of part of the cover of Linear Algebra Done Right in the upper right corner of this slide, then you can click on it to get to the book's website.